Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Nordenberg. I am the chair of the Institute of Politics uh, and the director of the Dick Thornburg Forum for Law and Public Policy. Uh, I do want to, in welcoming you, also welcome Ginny Thornburg, uh, the former First Lady of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and a driving force in the forum and many other good things. Uh, who is here with us today. Uh, and we'll give him a hand. And I also want to acknowledge Samantha Balbier, who is at the table with Jenny and who is the director of the Institute of Politics and is the driving force behind so much of that good work. Uh, it is, as you can imagine, uh, a particular pleasure uh, to invite or to welcome uh, Caitlin Polance back to campus. Uh, Caitlin was the editor-in-chief of the Pitt News when she was here as an undergraduate. Uh, she not only interviewed me, she interviewed my wife. Uh, and when the two of us reconnected, oh, maybe six months ago, uh, she thanked me for being so nice to her at a student leaders dinner that my wife and I hosted. Uh, and I wondered, well, what expectations did she have with respect to my behavior uh, if she was thanking me for being nice? Uh, actually, there is a little bit more to the story. Uh, she had been singled out uh, with a small number of other student newspaper editors around the country uh, for a special opportunity with the New York Times. Uh, and that, to me, certainly was deserving of acknowledgement uh, in that group that evening. Uh, and what that signals is that even as an undergraduate, uh, she was something of a star here at Pitt. She graduated in 2009 uh, and since then has been traveling a fast track course uh, through the world of journalism. Uh, how important is her work? Uh, let me put it to you this way. Uh, if you wake up at six o'clock in the morning uh, and you turn on CNN, as I often do, uh, the chances are very good uh, that Caitlin will be one of the first people you see that day uh, because she is so often in that 6 to 6.15 time slot uh, signaling the fact that uh, her network believes that the work she is doing uh, is among the most important things that will be reported on that day. Uh, Caitlin's parents, Joe and Joan Polance, are also here today. Uh, so I want to, yeah, let's, yeah. <laughs> Her dad, who is a good guy, was signaling for some applause. So I'm glad you <laughs> gave it to him. Uh, uh, they're here today, and it obviously is special for her and for us to also have them in the room. Uh, there will be time for uh, questions from the floor before we complete today's program, uh, but I did want to start out in a conversation with Caitlin myself. Uh, in the process, taking advantage of uh, some of the questions that were submitted by registrants in advance. Uh, and Caitlin, one of those submitted questions started out like a uh, nice general inquiry uh, into your journey from Pitt to CNN. Uh, but then it added, uh, or it ended, with a uh, pragmatic touch saying, in other words, how did you get that job? Uh, so let me ask you if you would begin by talking about your journey from Pitt to CNN, uh, but also make sure you 
touch on some of the particular experiences that you think uh, equipped you so well not only to land that job, but also to do so well in it? So I'll start with the short answer, which would be hard work, persistence, red glasses. Come back to that. Um, but the, the long answer is that I did start here at Pitt um, as a sophomore. I actually transferred here um, from Westminster College and came to Pitt and an advisor essentially plucked me and sent me over to the newspaper to spend my time uh, at the Pitt News. And I don't think at that point in time, I grew up in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and I, I didn't know anyone that worked in the news industry, and I didn't really see it as a profession that was a, an option even. Um, but then once I started working at the Pitt News, I really fell in love with the environment of a newspaper and specifically with reporting. Um, and I had professors here at Pitt who encouraged that, including some who are here. Um, and from then on, I remember my last day at Pitt, looking at the boxes of the Pitt News on the corner of the street. And it was 2009, which was not a great year for newspapers or the general economy. Um, and thinking, oh my gosh, I'm never going to see my name as a byline again. And so then and there I decided I want to go into the newspaper industry, which was difficult <laughs> uh, at the time. But I ended up being a local news reporter in Southern Virginia for several years. And I covered everything from schools to politics to agriculture, which was a great beat. It's like a weather beat with people that you can spend a whole day outside with. Um, and eventually I realized that, you know, the, the viable markets long term for journalism, the, the markets that really support people and allow them to grow for many decades in the industry um, are places like New York City, Washington, D.C. A lot of journalists in local news move around throughout their careers across the country. I, I wasn't necessarily interested in that. Um, and so I sent out a million resumes to places in Washington, D.C. I liked history. I liked the American presidency. Um, I was interested in that. I had watched all the president's men a million times by that point. Um, and I was hired at the PBS NewsHour as a TV producer. And I got there and immediately thought, oh, gosh, I don't ever want to work in television again. I mean, this seems, this is not for me. I want to go back to print. But at the PBS NewsHour, they have a very strong history of reporting on the Supreme Court and gave the opportunity to someone like me in my 20s to produce segments about the Supreme Court. And it happened to be 2012, which was the year of the Affordable Care Act case. I started learning the legal industry. And then shortly after that, the, in Washington, there has been a, an enormous growth of what's called the trade press, um, business to business publications or publications that exist behind a paywall for professionals in industry to purchase subscriptions to so that they can get some sort of intelligence either um, for publicly traded companies or for the business that they're doing in Washington, if they're lobbyists or um, in companies where they want to know what's going on in, in public policy. And so I went to a legal trade publication and I got there and immediately thought, oh gosh, I never want to cover courts. This is terrible. <laughs> And so instead of covering courts at this legal trade publication called the National Law Journal, American Lawyer Magazine, I wrote about Washington lawyers as a community and I learned the law firms. And the secret of Washington is that every prominent politician who comes through Washington, maybe not all of them, but a very large number of them spend time in private practice at the large corporate defense firms with offices in Washington. And I got to know um, lawyers who I was writing about little things that were happening in their law firms, but I was also asking them questions about, oh, you worked on the Whitewater investigation mm -hmm. of former President Clinton. That's interesting. Tell me about that. And so I got to know people. And in 2017, it was a moment in time where um, Donald Trump as president was under investigation with the Mueller investigation, 
Robert Mueller had been appointed special counsel, and there was quite a need to understand what was happening in the legal community and who would be representing people, not just the president himself, but the people around him who would become witnesses. And so CNN um, found me. I, at the time, was still set of never covering, never covering courts, never working in television. I never wanted to do breaking news. And I just was open to the possibility and got there. And within two days, um, my editor, the editor who hired me, said, we need someone to track all of the cases. There, there could be charges. And sure enough, there were several people charged in Donald Trump's inner circles from his campaign. Uh, there were cases against um, a Russian company that went through the court system and others in the Mueller investigation. And so I was there in the courtroom for everything and then eventually came around on the TV part of, of, um, of CNN because uh, I hadn't been doing it. I had been writing in, in print primarily and I've always thought of myself as a newspaper reporter primarily, but there are a lot of wonderful journalists at CNN who are both newspaper reporters or reporters with a traditional reporting background, maybe they come from television first, who are able to do both. Um, the shoe leather reporting, that is the sort of thing that, that would have been done during Watergate by Carl Bernstein and, and Bob Woodward. And, and there's a lot of people who now in Washington, you have to have all of these skills. And so I, I, I did eventually want to develop the television skill and that's, and that's where I am now. And boy, do you have it now. <laughs> uh, and, and it is interesting that uh, so many people who are on uh, cable news, uh, whether they're covering a legal beat or not, seem to have law degrees, but you never stopped along the way to get a legal education. No, I did not. Um, I, after being exposed to it at the National Law Journal, um, I don't know if it would be economically viable for me to go to law school. It's quite expensive, um, and when you come out, um, it's very difficult to to break into the corporate defense bar, which is where a lot of people pay off their loans. But um, I didn't get a law degree. There are many, many wonderful, prominent journalists who do have law degrees, especially within um, the group that covers the Supreme Court. But I found it's, it's not necessary for me, at least. Um, some of my colleagues at CNN who are on our justice beat um, have law degrees and put them to, to great use. I, I don't know how to write a motion in, in, in law, but I know how to read closely and I know how to ask questions and I've developed, I think, the ability to be able to speak to, to lawyers so that they think it's, I hope they think it's, it's worth their time to speak to me because their time is so valuable. Um, and, and that's how I, I go about doing what I do. And, and I, I think one of the things about law is that, and, and government really, is that it's all, well, I guess journalism largely too, is when you're covering a beat, it, it can be very cyclical or just have some sort of procedure in place where you can tell what the next steps might be, whether it's a law being proposed. We know how Congress works and what happens and what has to happen. And law is very much the same way where someone might be charged with a case or an investigation is ongoing. And there are things that happen in those in those cases that you can almost predict um, what the options might be. And so to be able to talk to people about, oh, what's next? What's next? What's next? That can guide a lot of the stories. Um, and I think that's a lot of the stories that, that I do. What is the evidence being collected? Who might the witnesses be that are being interviewed by investigators? What are the sort of filings that could come up in a case? Well, let me add two historical footnotes. Uh, the trade publications that you mentioned, the National Law Journal and the American Lawyer, regularly listed Attorney General Thornburg uh, as one of the most influential lawyers in the country. Uh, and a guy my age was really thrilled when you mentioned all the president's men. Uh, because I grew up with Watergate and Woodward and Bernstein and uh, the, the books and the movies, and I wondered 
uh, whether there was a more contemporary uh, inspiration for journalists. But if you say it's Woodward and Bernstein, that's fine with me. Can I say the Devil Wears Prada? <laughs> <laughs> I watch that one all the time. <laughs> Well, you know, this is showing what a small world it is because one of the stars of The Devil Wears Prada is the daughter of one of my former students from Pitt Law. Uh, so we've got all of these connections here. Everything runs through Pittsburgh. Well, I will say on, on that, I, I do watch The Devil Wears Prada quite a lot. I just did. Mm -hmm. And I, I watch it when I want to sort of connect to what it's like to be in this industry and, and to think about having to present yourself and what you're wearing and what that communicates and that you can do, you could be very intellectual or very smart or very effective at what you're doing, but you also have to pay attention to the other thing. And the, the glasses thing I was going to mention is I wear red glasses quite a lot. I wear a lot of different glasses on, on TV because I can't wear contacts for a full day, but I, my interview with, with Sienna and my colleagues still bring this up. I had it, I didn't know, I had very few connections within the, the, ju the justice team at CNN directly. I hadn't met them before when I went to interview there for this job to cover law in Washington, DC. But I showed up with red glasses and matching red shoes. And my, my boss still tells me that I walked out of the room and that's what they all were talking about and said, we have to hire her. So, um, and, and actually it's, it's been come very useful in that in this day and age, you know, I do do the, the TV now and people can sometimes recognize my name a little bit more than whenever it was in, in print only um, because they hear it said on television. But for a long time, the way to get my work out and the way to, develop your name, and this still is, is one of the ways to do that, is through Twitter, or X now, and for a long, my profile photo still is the red glasses, and I used to sit during the Mueller investigation, and after I spent a lot of time at the federal court in Washington, D.C., and I didn't have the ability to go and talk to law firms in meetings as much as I had when I was an American lawyer, and they really wanted that coverage. And so I would sit over at the federal court in the cafeteria and prominent lawyers would come through the cafeteria and people would recognize me, which was really because I had these red glasses on. So it ended up being a branding thing that, that became quite useful because I could walk up to a lawyer who might not want to give this, you know, 20 something journalists the time of day in the, in the courthouse when they're off to a hearing before a judge. But I could say, oh, I'm Caitlin Polance, and they could say, oh, I recognize you from Twitter. I love your glasses. And so it, it ended up working out. You're not recommending that for me, though. I don't know. <laughs> we could go shopping. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, we had a program in this series that featured David Shripman, who you know, uh, then the Pulitzer Prize winning editor of the Post-Gazette. Uh, and the title for his presentation was, Does the Truth Still Matter? Uh, his answer at that point was yes, uh, but I wonder how you feel about that today. Do facts and the truth still matter? Absolutely. Um, truth matters. Those words <laughs> are were spoken by a prosecutor on the Roger Stone case in the rebuttal closing argument. So some of the last things a jury heard in federal court in Washington, D.C. And I will never forget that rebuttal argument for how powerful it was. The prosecutor's name was uh, Mike Mirando. He's still out there working as a lawyer. And he delivered a closing argument about the truth matters and the place it matters most is in the courtroom in the spheres of justice. Um, and there are still institutions like journalism uh, and like the justice system in, in which evidence is sought after. Primary sources are pursued and secured and surfaced and cohesive understandings of what happened is able to emerge. And, I mean, the jury convicted Roger Stone of, of the 
crimes of lying to Congress that he was accused of. He later was pardoned uh, by President Trump. But I absolutely believe that truth matters, and I think that that message still resonates with people. But there is tension, isn't there? Because there are participants in judicial proceedings and certainly people who use the media to spread things that are not factual or truthful. Yes, and I, uh, I, this is something that we confront quite a bit in reporting, especially on the federal courts. Um, there are no cameras in federal courts, period. You can't watch a proceeding, and that is something that the judicial system is not going to allow unless they make an exception, which I believe 20 media organizations just today asked the judicial system and asked the judge in the Trump case in Washington, D.C., the January 6, 2020 election case, to allow four cameras at that trial in that proceeding uh, because the judicial system, there's two issues that create a situation that make it difficult for truth and evidence to come out. One is there, it's very difficult for many people to observe a proceeding. And so you saw this um, in many of the January 6th rioter cases, and there's actually a federal judge in DC who sentenced several of these rioters. His name is Royce Lambert, former chief judge in DC, who has called the sentences or the sentencing hearings he's given of January 6th rioters crocodile tears because he's experienced the first rioter ever sentenced in any of the January 6th proceedings, came into his courtroom, spoke about how she was so appalled by the violence, that court proceeding was never able to be televised. What Judge Lambert said in response to her was never be able to be seen other than snippets in writing or read by a reporter like me or an anchor on television. And after that proceeding, that defendant went on Fox News and spoke about how she saw people being very peaceful at the Capitol on January 6th. And that ability for someone to say something to a judge, to accept responsibility for what happened, to acknowledge what happened, and for that evidence to be presented in court just so that person can walk outside and say something different to a camera, is you're seeing this to a certain extent play out in this case that Donald Trump is facing in New York right now, where what the images in this and what you're hearing is what the district or what the attorney general of New York, Tish James, is saying to cameras before the proceeding. You're seeing what Donald Trump is saying as he's coming into the courtroom. He could come out and say, this is what happened in court. And no one is able to see what actually happened in court. The other thing in the court system that adds to this problem, and I do call it a problem, uh, I, I hope in my lifetime, the cameras in the courtroom policy of the federal judiciary changes so that there are cameras or audio or something captured there. The other thing is that there is, thankfully in this country, due process. But the challenge of that is that there are people who understand how to exploit the judicial system to put things into the record and make a press conference about a lawsuit they filed, say, or about a series of affidavits that they collected after the election that supposedly to them mean that there was fraud across Pennsylvania or in the city of Philadelphia, which is what Rudy Giuliani did um, in Philadelphia at the Four Seasons Total Landscaping press conference. And those affidavits, those things were filed in the court system, and it gives them an air of credibility to be able to say these are lawyers putting these documents into the court system. They will be tested by a judge. There were people um, who, who continued to argue, well, it's still going through the court. Let the judges look at it. Judges did look at those things, and they weighed on them, and they ruled on them, and they held hearings on them, including Trump-appointed judges in the federal system, and those proceedings that some of them happened very fast, but still there was a lag time. Um, it allowed the disinformation, I think, around the 2020 election to flourish. And the judges, you can get their full opinion looking at every claim that was made. But you aren't, it's not the same thing as seeing what a judge says to the lawyers um, 
still uh, the the hearing in the middle district of Pennsylvania that Rudy Giuliani argued that was a federal proceeding. So um, there is no audio recording or video of that. It was something that if you wanted to see how those arguments played out where the Trump campaign lost that case um, that was before Judge Brand, you would just have to be able to read about it. And that is not the same thing as the medium of, of television or audio. Um, and you know, there are sanctions proceedings that have gone with, on with some of the lawyers involved there that there, there just isn't uh, as forceful or as, as much of a bully pulpit as there is with, with cameras. Well, you know, the opinions in Pennsylvania, as you're suggesting, uh, were not in any sense equivocal. Uh, they were strong and they were straight and they said there is nothing to this uh and i think if you read them uh you know they can have an impact but nobody does you know uh, unless you're a lawyer uh or are in some other way uh you know kind of pulled into the opinions uh now you're talking about individuals who are uh, straying from the truth. Uh, but it's not at all uncommon these days to have people make sweeping comments about the media not being truthful. Uh, yeah, I, I heard it yesterday. I was in a meeting with a board and uh, one of them basically began railing against all of the media. Uh, and you do see uh, opinion polls, too, which show a, a dramatic uh, decrease in the trust that ordinary people have uh, for what they read in the media. Uh, is that fair? How did we get here? I don't know if I have the answer to that. That's a very big question. Um, I, I think it's quite clear that the trust in institutions like Congress, like the courts, like the press, the democratic institutions of this country, and I would, I would put the press in that as the fourth estate as well, um, that there has been a, a decline in public trust. Um, but that doesn't mean that there are not large journalistic institutions, media companies, even media companies with that might have a leaning to the right or to the left who are not putting in the work to do reporting and to find fact and to ask tough questions. Um, I think that there, there is still a great tradition across Washington of the press corps being, the press corps just being a, a vigorous body that wants to make sure we're not just explaining what's happening in Washington to the general public or to whatever the readership might be, but also to um, do it in a way that, that holds, holds organizations, agencies, uh, elected officials to account. And so, yeah, I, I, I think, I hope that, that people are able to continue to understand that journalism is something that's vital for for democracy it if it if it goes away if that reporting traditions are if those reporting traditions are lost and if things are lost uh local newspapers um student newspapers student journalism classes uh professors who are in the industry and passing on the knowledge of reporting to students if those things are lost, the entire community suffers. And, um, and that can be a community of any size. It could be the pit community. It could be um, specialty, uh, more niche communities. It could be the legal community if, if the National Law Journal American Lawyer were lost uh, or legal press. Or it could be greater things, the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the country. Are there ways uh, for readers to distinguish between uh, what are reliable information sources and those that are not? Excuse me, 
readers or viewers? <laughs> um, I think, yes, I, I hope so. I think that, I think one of the things that happens, uh, at least in the national press, is that if you are reading a variety of publications and not everything of uh, just in one, you know, ideological column. So if you're reading, um, you know, what's, if you're watching CNN and other networks and you're also reading the Washington Post, the New York Times, your local paper, it's, it, there tends to be, uh, people do tend to to coalesce around a truth ultimately as it's being pulled out. And sometimes it takes time. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, some, some people w would call it like corporate media, but I, I do think that having a lot of eyes, um, you know, there's a reason in the White House press room, it's not just one reporter every day, it's, it's the whole press. And so I think looking for, you know, if there's a story out there that you see and no one else is going with it in the same or has picked it up or casting doubt on some of the sources that are behind that story, that's a, that's a reason to be a little bit more skeptical. That isn't to say that sometimes you're out in front as an organization um, on a hot story. But um, I think that, you know, the, the big media organizations do a, an enormous amount to make sure that their reporting is very solid and, and credible. And, and there's a lot of reporting that goes on that never makes a story and never gets into print. And, you know, our television uh, appearances are, are very short now, a minute, two minutes. There's only so much you can say in that amount of time. Um, the other thing I think is just the number of sources, the credibility of who those sources might be, um, if they're, you know, former attorneys general or former uh, prominent people in the field, that tends to to make a difference too. Well, your beat is the courts, uh, and the courts really have been undergoing what might be called a stress test, uh, as they are being called on to protect the rule of law and other democratic values. How would you say they're doing? Um, I, I have great faith in the way the, the judiciary works, um, given that it's a system that has been structured from what the days of the Magna Carta, that's uh, the foundation that's built upon and the body of law that's out there. There's so much law that is built upon precedent and how things have, have come through the system before. And so I, I do think that there are, you know, a lot of, of, that the system theoretically should be able to to handle um, with credibility the issues that come before it. It is why there are appeals and and things like that. And and there are you know there's there's always opinions and decisions that that people might agree with. But yeah, I do think that that a lot of judges um, are are quite interested in the intellectual side of the law and and weighing that and I spend a lot of time reading judges opinions um and lawyers motions too to see what they're arguing on either side and it's it's always it's always illuminating to see the conversation between between different courts or different judges which does happen well we'll come back to the courts but you also have covered uh the work of the January 6th house select committee. Uh, can you talk about the processes that were employed by that body uh, and how well you think they did uh, in communicating effectively with the public? Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's, I'm not a person to, to judge Congress. And also, I don't even really, I cover Congress to a certain extent. Um, uh, from a separation of powers capacity more so than anything. So if there's a congressional dispute with the executive branch or the presidency and it ends up in the court system, I do tend to cover those sorts of, of issues. Um, but the January 6th committee was, was a really interesting moment in the way Congress does hearings 
because, um, and there's been reporting on this by Robert Draper in the New York Times about how that committee did its work behind closed doors, interviewed aggressively very, very many witnesses, and then had to make an agreement that was bipartisan, because there were members of that committee, both Republicans and Democrats, that they had to come to an agreement that they weren't using those hearings for individual platform advancement in the way that you might see um, congressional hearings today, um, especially ones that go you know, all day. Each member gets a chance to ask questions. In that situation, there were members that were giving up the ability to answer questions or to ask questions of witnesses that they called before them. And those proceedings ended up being concise presentations of the evidence that they had gathered, um, which I, th I think was, was quite effective in just as a viewer to be able to watch. Um, but also as we were able to, to cover it, the committee essentially worked through many of the witnesses and the evidence that the Justice Department ultimately has also been working through in its investigation of January 6th and the 2020 election. And so one of the things that committee also did was they structured their hearings in a way that allowed you to think about um, the the plans in different, you know, the plans of the the Trump campaign in connecting to you know the the judiciary with with Jeffrey Clark or to talk to states or the fake electors plan. Now I don't I don't know what will happen in those ongoing court cases and find them to be very interesting um, legally. I'm I'm curious if there will be any judges that or if you know Judge Chutkin in D.C. how she is is going to be continuing handling the public discussion of January 6th and the 2020 election. There's a hearing coming up next week about that um, because it has a lot of the witnesses have testified publicly on video in Congress. Uh, those witnesses may be called back very, very possibly to trial. Well, I uh, picked up your choice of words when you said things that were ultimately also covered by the Department of Justice there are a lot of people who have said uh, that it was the work of the January 6th committee that spurred the Department of Justice into a, a different level of action. Do you have a view on that? I don't know, and I don't have the reporting to say definitively at this time. The one thing that I would point out in when you look back um, in the public record that the there was there were court cases that were going on under seal to try and get access to certain things that the Justice Department was trying to get access to. So the I, I think it was the email records of some of the the prominent people that were trying to aid Donald Trump after the election. Um, those things were going on before or right around the time that the hearings were happening. And so, there were existing pieces of that Justice Department investigation very clearly. They just might not have been visible to the, to the general public or even to the press. You know, you've covered the work of the January 6th committee, uh, and you've covered the prosecutions of January 6th defendants. I think a lot of us turned on our televisions that day and could not believe what was happening in the Capitol. Uh, do you have a sense of how it is that people came to do the things they were doing uh, during the riots in the Capitol that day? Well, there have been many of them who have um, explained to judges, particularly at their sentencings, that they were swept away or felt that they wanted to engage in politics, that this was an area of politics that they were interested in. And that when they got there, they, you know, felt swept up in the crowd and wanted to to take part somehow. 
you know, there are also very clearly people who have been found guilty at trial by juries of conspiracy, seditious conspiracy, um, and and people who have been sentenced and will serve significant sentences for violence, uh, and very clearly people who brought weapons to the Capitol um, that day. So I don't know if you can characterize everyone, but um, there were the there is quite a robust record where every defendant um, has has a story and has a reason that they were there, whether they were are are you know what I said before about some of them say one thing to a judge and and not that something else outside of court. And that's very hard to distinguish. But you know I'm there to capture what those people are saying, what the judge's determinations are. Um, and what juries do if they do go to trial. And the example that you gave before is not an isolated example, is it? No, not at all. Uh, there have been there have been several others um, who have done similar things, said something in court, and then done something after. Um, actually, that the judge the the judge who spoke about Judge Lambert, who spoke about the crocodile tears of defendants. Um, he also has pointed this out in the in the case of Jacob Chansley, who might be one of the most memorable images from the Capitol riot, the man, um, the QAnon shaman, who um, I attended his sentencing, and he, he, he spoke at his sentencing for quite a long time to Judge Lambert uh, with, with great remorse. Um, but then after he was sentenced, uh, and actually the judge, Judge Lambert said to him at the sentencing, I, I believe you fully have want to, you know, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I, I believe, I believe you essentially. Um, and then, you know, Chansley afterwards filed several motions to try and, um, get rid of the, the prosecution believed he had not gotten all of the evidence and, and the judge has been, has written opinions that are quite incensed about that. Uh, whether, well, on January 6th, we saw violence, uh, and whether, actions today are in state court or in federal court, whether they're civil or they're criminal, uh, there seems to be a real concern about violence and the threats of violence, uh, concern by the courts, concern about jurors and uh, grand jurors. And uh, what can you say about that? Well, there are... Um there are definitely threats that, that we have covered at CNN um, made to judges. Um, there are judges currently that have significant security protection around them um, and who Thanks. say quite publicly that they won't be backing down from doing their job. This is a, a job. It is part of the democratic um, system. It's part of the, the American government. So these judges will be presiding, jurors, grand jurors. Um, there are protections around them. I, I mean, I, I personally was able to cover both um, Donald Trump's arraignment in federal court in Florida. Um, I was in the courtroom for that and also in the courtroom for his arraignment in federal court in DC. Um, so the classified documents case in Florida and then the, the 2020 election case in DC and um, there's, there was an immense amount of preparation from security um, to make sure that those scenes and those buildings were protected. And, and I, I assume that that's going to be just as, as significant going forward. And I don't think that you can ever really predict what will happen. I, people predicted January 6th. Um, I think it's kind of the thing about news. You can't really predict it. Um, <laughs> uh, but it, you know, there is clearly... There's clearly threats that that exist um, still, um, and the federal government, I think, is as far as they say that they are trying to combat that. And it is a price of public service or civic service uh, that never did exist in the past, either in terms of the dollars that are being invested in security uh, or the fear that people may live in. Uh, because of the threats that are hanging over their heads. Uh, I have more questions to ask you, and I'm going to reserve the right to ask at least one more. 
Uh, but before I do that, why don't we see if there are questions from members of the audience? And we've got one right over here. Okay, so this is going to be a big multi-part question. Um, but the Supreme Court is a really hot topic, and um, especially about how far right it's becoming and um, their lack of an ethical code like that's legally enforceable. Um, so what can you say about kind of the court as, like, is it becoming a political institution instead of a legal one? Instead of a legal one, um, just what are your thoughts on that? I don't know if I have an opinion on that because I do not cover the Supreme Court Kim. Um, anymore uh, since I did it at the news hour. And, you know, I think that I think that the role of the journalists that, that do cover the court, that they spend a lot of time making sure we're following, you know, are the, are the judges meeting their ethical codes that are in place, what they choose to do, that's within their body. And, and you know, we have confirmation processes in Congress um, to cover and to to learn about the judges and justices that are put on those courts, um, and I I actually think one of the more powerful things is just people paying attention. It's 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 the the judiciary is not always the most entertaining part of of news coverage, and and especially you know knowing judges. But I I think it's really important to pay attention to the Supreme Court and to other courts um, wherever they are because I. There's two parts of the federal government that regular citizens have to interact with all the time. One is you pay your taxes. And the other part is there are individual people who are criminal defendants that go before judges or who go before judges in civil cases. And so making sure with, that we are explaining what's happening to them, I think, is the most important thing. But I don't, um, I'm, they're, you know, by definition, they're a legal body. Question number two. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, so, I I definitely agree that it's a matter of journalistic integrity to tell the truth in the news, like as it happens. Um, but I've noticed that for a lot of networks that have gained a lot of popularity in recent years, the truth is either a responsibility or it can be a liability to them, um, in terms of like you know what their audience will believe or accept. And I've noticed that for those networks for whom the truth is kind of a disadvantage, everyone from January 6th rioters to people in Congress have cited them as um, support for their beliefs that are often in extremes. So I've wondered that, you know, since this progression seems to only be getting, in my view, worse, do you think the responsibilities behind journalism are changing? Or do you think we're just getting further from those responsibilities we have as time goes by? I don't know if the responsibilities behind journalism um, is changing. I, I, I do hope that people still see um, a need to understand, just the general public understand the difference between opinion and, and factual reporting. And, um, you know, there are quality journalists at a lot of different organizations. Um, and so, you know, they're, one of the things that we have seen is this blurring of the line between opinion and fact. And, um, and I don't know if that's because, you know, primary sources are harder to come by on the internet or something like that. But, but I, I think there are still very responsible journalists out there and, and all kinds of organizations who want to do um, excellent reporting, factual work. Got a question on this side of the room, Mark? Um. Hi, I'd just like to thank you for coming today. Uh, as someone who's, for analogy, watching from like the bleachers, looking at the game, at the court, um, do you think that one day there could be like, we could get rid of this whole web of mistrust and information that we now have over the past like eight or so years 
do you think that we could have hope in the media again and how would we go about that? Well, that's not up to me. That's up to people like, like you, people who consume media. Um, I come up, I'm every day going to do my job and put out the type of reporting that I spend a lot of time on um, to make sure that, that we're accurate and that we're factual and that I have a good understanding of the context of something. But I do think um, one of the things that happens um, historically is that our understanding of the facts of a circumstance tend to congeal over time. And a lot of that comes from reporting, not just in the moment, the say the first draft of history, but also the journalists who go back and write books, um, digging further into topics or moments. And, and that over time, um, you kind of can coalesce around a, a factual understanding of something. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't things that have happened historically that our understanding as a country is incorrect um, or that, that incorrect things become part of the historical body. But I mean, it's sort of like the fluidity between, I, I do think there's a through line from journalism to American history, like as, a, as an intellectual subject. Does that make sense? Let's have one more question from the floor, Jim. You have mentioned the fusion of facts and fiction in some of the reporting. This was one of the points of criticism of George Orwell and also in the German uh, context, Karl Kraus, uh, turn of the century, 1900 and beginning of the 20th century. I'm wondering, in your training to become a journalist and in the training of others to become journalists, do they study George Orwell, for instance, his critique of the press? And his remarks are so important today, too. I wonder if journalists who tend to mix facts and fiction do remember George Orwell. Uh, I hope so. I know I certainly read um, in high school uh, Brave New World, Aldous Huxley, and uh, 1984, which would be Orwell. And, and I know that there are, I um, hope that was right, sorry. I'm a lit, I, and I majored in literature here at, at Pitt, but spent a lot of time at the Pitt News as well. Uh, but I do think that one of the things that is valuable to journalism as an industry and that um, is indicative not just of the practices here at Pitt for students, but also across the industry, is that you asked about journalists that go to law school. There's also journalists that go to medical school, journalists that uh, not everyone who's coming into the practice of journalism is setting out just to do that. Uh, there are people from all sorts of backgrounds and who I think are probably exposed to like a wide variety of literature and, and things like that. I, I hope that that people, you know, are reading um, literature like that to to make sure they're informed and not just journalism. The overarching theme of these sessions is preserving democracy. Uh, can you give us, from your vantage point, uh, your perspective on what is the current condition of American democracy? <laughs> decline. Her mother Answer. thinks that was an unfair question. <laughs> um, I, I have a, I have a narrow window into into certain things: um, the court system, the legal industry, some investigations that are going on now, some particular court cases, and there are systems in place that have worked for a very long time. Um, and there are, you know, journalistic institutions that I hope survive um, for a very long time. There, there are threats, um, you know, there are clearly political threats to, to it, that include disinformation and there are foreign actors that are threats to, um, there are threats to factual information. Um, 
who want to sow disinformation across the U.S. But at, at the end of the day, um, I hope that media organizations themselves remain very robust and large and able to fund the sort of journalism that 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 we do. I think that that's a, a very important thing in democracy. And I, I, I hope to I like would like to think that um, the press is 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 healthy right now. We have a, a vigorous press corps. We have um, a lot of journalists in, in Washington, particularly. I would hope that in I hope that communities also would would step up and support local journalism um, just as much uh, because that is a, a very important thing. But it, I mean, there's quite a lot lost in American democracy if if the press is diminished. Well, it's wonderful not only to have the chance to see you on the screen, uh, but to get you back here in person. Uh, I know Caitlin has a strong interest in Pitt and in the Pitt News, uh, so I suspect that she will be back on campus on future occasions as well. Uh, and I hope we can get you back in this role because yes. and it's been great. One of Thank you. And thank you for having me. Thank you to the Thornburgs. Um, one of the most influential things when I was here at Pitt as a student to set me on this path was to be able to meet ind industry professionals. There's a number of journalists, student journalists from the Pitt News who are here. So if you do work in media and you would be willing to stick around and meet them, I would love to introduce you to them because the future of this aspect of democracy is in this room, uh, the future of the news industry, journalism, and the way that those students learn and the way that we continue this on um, to be able to have a fourth estate is by exposing those students to the people who are doing the work now and making sure that we're preserving those traditions and passing them down from generation from, to generation, from organization to, to organization. Well, please join me uh, in saying thanks to Caitlin Polance, Editor-in-Chief Emeritus of the Pitt Woods. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.